Yes. Okay, good morning everybody. Did you hear me? Yeah? It is my honor and pleasure again to share the first session of, uh, of this morning. And I'm very pleased the organizers decided that I will be sharing a session with other friends and dear colleagues. Um, we will be looking into the material closely related to the Eastern Adriatic Coast and its hinterlands. So without further ado, I would like to call the first speaker of the, of the day, Jose Marmolina, who is a PhD candidate at Camp Foster University in Venice and also a collaborative team member of the EFC Agra Cult uh, project. So Jose, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. So, keeping in mind the different opinions uh, on the paradigm and center periphery expressed respectively by Kahneman and Casanova in this group, my paper intends to provide some reflections on the influence that the relationship between Venice and Venetian Dalmatia in political and cultural terms had on Dalmatian artistic production during uh, the 15th century. In particular, the purpose is to propose some questions about the role that Dalmatia as a Venetian province, using this term in the Carmen sense, 
might have helped for the Serenissima during the Quattrocento. The focus is on the ways this Venetian perspective could have influenced specifically the public art and architecture produced in Venetian towns. As a result of a specific territorial strategy carried out for installing the authority through the urban space. We all know that at the beginning of the 15th century, the Republic of Venice increased its territorial dominions. Between 1409 and 1420, Venice acquired Dalmatia and imposed its territorial control over the eastern Adriatic coast and the related islands. Unlike other maritime domains, such as the islands in the Levante, which were intended more as colonies with obvious exceptions, the Eastern Adriatic Coast was treated like the territories of the Stato da Terra as an integral part of the state over which the Senate intended to apply laws and administrative practices in perfect equivalence with those carried out within the Dogado. Starting from 1420, Venice included Dalmatian communes in its administrative organization chart giving them new functions and political roles that reflected the political and economic importance that the region had for the Republic as part of its Stato da Mar. The same is for the Stato da Terra. The Dalmatian municipalities, due to their economic importance, might have been intended by the Serenissima as an expression of Venice itself and inserted in a territorial policy aimed at providing them with new symbols and forms able to represent the new ruling power. Although, in practice, this happened to be more complicated than how it was in the Terra Ferma. In this situation, considering Venice as both a political and an artistic center, and Dalmatia as one of its provinces, one wonders what can the center actually do in artistic terms in a province under its dominion. For instance, it promotes and finances public works that could symbolize its presence and authority over the territory or also it provides new symbols in architectural or artistic forms able to represent itself for a collective recognition, or it sends artists from the center who can express the importance of the center itself to be involved in the local commissions or official endeavors, but also can manipulate the functions of the public architecture in space and so on. However, what made the Eastern Adriatic Coast different in other territories is that upon its arrival in Dalmatia, the Serenissima found several municipalities with a strong communal identity, expressing already well established all forms of self government and urban structures. This imposed to Venice a negotiating strategy with local elites for obtaining their trust. This factor made since the beginning the communes of the Eastern Adriatic Coast politically different from the cities of the Venetian Terra Ferma and determined for Venice the development of a specific territorial strategy to be adapted to local context. <coughs> Talking about governmental institutions in Dalmatian towns under Venetian dominion in the 15th century, needs to be always specified in terms of a duality between the state power, so to say the Venetian political presence, and the local administration, which was represented by the communal councils. Venice decided for Dalmatian communes to retain, to retain the old statutes and some elements of political autonomy when not in contrast with its own necessities. The union marks between these two components, Venetian and communal, were the Venetian counts, who were the actual urban rulers and the representative of the state in Dalmatia, but also the mouthpieces of the local elites. These elements might have been at the base of a specific idea that Venice might have developed about its own Eastern Adriatic dominions after the imposition of its power. And it could have influenced its artistic control over public building sites or commissions. At this regard, is it possible to believe that during the 15th century, the necessity for Venice to deal with the strong political and cultural communal identity of the Dalmatian towns and the choice of using a negotiating territorial policy resulted in, a, in some sort of peripheralization of Dalmatia from the central artistic system. How the artistic production within Dalmatian urban public sphere reflected the central attempt to diffuse representative symbols and political meanings in the province. Right after 1420, the most important Dalmatian towns underwent through important 
uh, urban changes, useful for adapting spaces and buildings to Venetian functional needs. The first investments made by Venice were aimed, together with the restoration of the fortresses, at the reconstruction of the public building. In the majority of the Dalmatian towns, the Serenissima decided to keep these buildings in their medieval position and to preserve their public role within the already well established urban structures. This contributed to the development of the public squares of Dalmatian towns in the form of courts for the representative communication policies carried out by the governmental institutions, with, um, um, which were both Venetian and communal. This implies the necessity to read historically the artistic and architectonic political symbols in the Dalmatian public squares, not as a simple unequal expression of a Venetian representativeness program, but as a result of specific and distinguished political languages eventually unified in the sharing of public space under the Venetian authority. This contributed to making more significant in symbolic terms the process of reconfiguring the public space of provincial territories and to justify the large investments given for the main artistic commissions by the, the Venetian Senate under the request of the local communal councils. Is it possible to distinguish in these public spaces some sort of independence between Venetian and municipal commissions? At which level of clarity can we observe the actual Venetian impact on the changes made in Dalmatian public spaces? Venice certainly had a decisive role in the promotion, financing, and approval of certain works, but it always placed within the city councils an active local commissioning. It seems that Venice did not always make a direct contribution, but responded to different levels of needs and meanings that came from different voices connected to the complex local civic environment. Therefore, the architectural and artistic redesign of public urban space, which is certainly to be included in the Venetian territorial policy, reveals a mixture of a more complex series of cultural matters, which, although taking place under the consent of the Venetian Senate, need to be specified as a specific expression of communal identity values promoted by local institutions. The impact that the Republic had on Dalmatian urban changes can be traced on the commitment to the setting on new forms, new functions, and above all, new symbols, which were gradually grafted in different ways and in constant parallelism with the symbols of the communes. The use of specific styles and forms and the specific iconographic programs used for representing these two components, Venetian and communal, proceeded during the 15th century at the same pace ended up in some cases overlapping, and in others proceeding independently, although always under Venetian permission. The same duality might have been at the basis also of the choice of the artists and workshops to be involved in the main public building sites. Basically, each component of the artistic and architectonic production within the public space of Dalmatian towns throughout the 15th century might have been the consequence of the duality between state and community. The restrictions that the Serenissima had to deal with in carrying out a total action and manipulation of the local political institutions and urban space might have determined for Dalmatia, in artistic terms, the displacement in some sort of prolonged external dimension from the center, a dimension which was handled perhaps more directly by local institutions. What Venice did at first was trying to maintain order and to gain the trust of local elites and to exploit the strategic role provided to the subjected territories, remarking the importance of Dalmatia in the Adriatic trade roads, which meant for the towns in the coast to be gradually increased over the years in their importance and in the achieving of prestigious political and economic roles within the Venetian organization chart. Although, in art and architecture, the Venetianization of these towns had to be always carried out with attention to the wills of the local communal councils. So what made politically and economically central and Venetian the Dalmatian towns ended up making Dalmatia more or less detached from the center in artistic terms and way more interested by the artistic commissioning of local institutions, even in the public space. So how the artistic and constructive environments in Dalmatian towns expressed their ties uh, with Venice during the 15th century? All the urban changes in Dalmatian towns, especially in the early decades of the century, revealed, at least in financial terms, the Venetian intention of emphasizing its sovereignty and protection, as well as its efforts 
to bring local needs in line with the aspiration of the center. However, this is to, happen, to be happened quite cautiously and gradually, since the Venetian presence created new loyalties with the local patriciae and city councils and new forms of dialogue and political collaboration. At this regard, Venetian investment in public buildings was particularly evident during the 15th century and increased later on. Basically, the Venetian towns councils um, requested the financing of specific public works, and the Venetian government swiftly sent appropriation and funds uh, according to both its own intentions and local institutions' um, necessities. In some cases, Venice expressed its necessity of self representation using minor architectural or artistic details, symbolically remarking in their appearance Venetian presence. Among these details, floral like Gothic windows or doors, the coats of arms of Venetian counts, and most of all, the Lion of San Mark, which was the ample zone on every public building. In Split, one of the first endeavor carried out by Venice for making some examples was the repair of the communal palace, which is now destroyed. After the restoration, it presented clear Venetian architectonic and decorative elements in its facade. And the large investments carried out in this case, directly by Venetian Senate, proved that by the archival sources, revealed the responsibility of Venice in this formal application, so to say the attention paid by the center to create a strategy for the province, able to link the physical and historical revision of the local public buildings and the new institutions they have to reflect. In Trogir, the dialogue between state and communal systems was even clearer. Right after the Venetian conquest, each building in the Platea Comunis was restored and other brand new constructions were erected. Among these, the Chapel of St. John in the cathedral, the Church of St. Sebastian and the New Baptistry. They became public places for the exercise of political functions and constituted recognizable celebrity monuments of local communal identity. In these cases, it is still difficult to understand whether Venice intended or not to introduce any symbols directly connected to its authority over the commune. Also because here, the financing came from the communal institutions and not from the state. The space used by Venice to really represent its presence in authority in Trogir's square was actually the Nulo Germania. Um, the Nulo Germania, where a high relief depicting St. Mark's lion with the local protector saints and the Count's coat of arms emphasized the authority presence of the Serenissima in the city, a relation to the local civic institutions acting as a political manifesto. In Shiveni, the political symbolism of the main square was mainly concentrated in the new cathedral. The great building represented for the city authorities an extremely important affair and was financed using different sources, both managed by the city council and the bishop and by the Venetian Senate. For these reasons, the building became a real public architecture and an ideal platform for the transmission to the community of collective values and meanings, which this time directly involved the Venice. The iconographic program of the external sculptural um, the decoration was conducted constantly depicting the relationship between the communal identity and the state. It was expressed by the presence of important saints like St. Mark, St. Michael, St. James, St. Jerome, and by the coats of arms of the Venetian counts. So to conclude, the choice for the masters and workshops to be involved seems to have been part of the same complex mixture of factors, which at this time does not give precise indications on the direct responsibility of the Venetian authorities. Also because unlike the center where the artistic market was way more dynamic, in Dalmatia, recurrent floating workshops moved throughout the region, involved in such different contexts of commissioning, both public and private. Nicolò di Giovanni Fiorentino might have been arrived in Dalmatia thanks to the relationship with the Trogir's count and Giselando, or with some exponent of the local <coughs> medical elites. Giorgio da Severnico might have been involved in the prestigious building site of Shiveni Cathedral, which involved the direct political and economic interests, also Venice, thanks to their relationship with the Venetian authority. In both cases, 
The two artists are documented in Venice right before their arrival in Dalmatia, and they have been chosen for important institutional artistic works throughout the region, among other local artists, and this was mainly due to their experience in, in Venice. This might allow the hypothesis that the Serenissima contributed more directly to their involvement. If so, this might reveal for some artistic commitments that Dalmatian towns might have been devised by the Serenissima at least in specific important occasions, such as the construction of Shibani's Cathedral, with a type of attention similar to the one reserved for the center. Thank you. for this fantastic uh, paper which led us throughout um, the relationship between political center, artistic center, and Dalmatian, Dalmatian times. Our next speaker is uh, Carla Papas, also uh, a PhD candidate at Kapowska University and a team member of our Direct Book Project who will be talking about uh, the re relationship between center and circulation of early modern communication knowledge. Carla, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yasi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes. OK. So in this paper, I will attempt to deconstruct the center for free dualism within the discourse of the fortification architecture on the eastern Adriatic coast between the 15th and the 18th centuries, while also taking into consideration the periphery province and border area system proposed by Nibokarin. So, the investment of the military principles in New Europe can be followed from the end of the 15th century and was supported by the dissemination of technical knowledge. Already in the 13th century, the spread of gunpowder all over Europe was an introduction toward the development of modern weaponry, the firearms, which were particularly modernized after the 16th century and throughout decades completely adapted on the battlefields. In the eastern coast of Adriatic, changes caused by the appearance of firearms came with the Ottomans. The shortcomings of the former fortifications were strategically bad position, the insufficient surface of the defended area, and insufficient defensive force. In addition, the Ottoman army was well armed and prepared for long sieges, so the incessant wars caused frequent changes of borders, which made this territory suitable for studying changes in military architecture. But in addition, easier book distribution was possible after the discovery of printing press, influencing the production of greater accessibility to wider literate population. And from the 15th century, interest in fortification architecture is evident in a vast number of print books. They were used as construction manuals, and some were theoretical works in which authors reviewed both tradition and existing models, as well as fundamental moral principles to justify their new constructive solutions and proposals. Uh, this launched the creation of so-called polygons for extensive modernization of respective defense systems, which were directed from the metropolis, but devised and realized in these primary areas. Thus triggering several questions about the circulation of knowledge scheme for this particular vital architectural typology. Because in warfare, state borders uh, are the regions of the focus. And they certainly were spaces of armed conflicts, but also served as spaces of construction practices. Border environment as an area uh, that reacts to external artistic, especially stylistic influences, was one of the main research topics of an art historian in Karman. In his book, A Dialogue and Odomacha Srebrenica with Mustafa Karma, Karma decided to demonstrate how different areas do react to external influences by observing the reaction of environment as an area with the characteristic of the provincial border and peripheral milieu. He stresses out that the art of a region is determined by changeable socioeconomic circumstances and unchangeable factors of a forced geographical location that affects the usage of material as well as the added factor. So the question is, is such approach applicable to each architectural technology? How profound is to study fortification architecture through this prism? To answer these questions and to distinguish the approach to differences, it is necessary to analyze the representation of fortification architecture in Karaman's book. And furthermore, because of my initial disagreements with tripartite categorization in the case of fortification architecture, 
I also want to analyze more profoundly how does he define the term center, particularly in the context of the Venetian Republic. So key word uh, in Ljubo Karaman's thesis is style. He explicitly expresses as his main interest the process of exchange of artistic styles throughout history. Each of these three categories is defined in relation to the center, mainly that center is referred to as an artistic center. In the introduction, provincial environment is in, I call the shadow of cultural midpoint, or living midpoint, or artistic midpoint. Here, I deliberately do not use the term center, uh, because he's also using the Croatian term sredeštem, not center. So borderline environment is an area of coexistence of two different artistic circles, while peripheral environment is that of several leading cultural areas. So the question is, are these centers nominated? Yes, and very explicitly. The one that particularly stands out because is in relation to other is, of course, Venice. Uh, the other that is never explicitly defined as a center, but is always referred to as such, is the so-called Islamic art of the Ottoman Empire, which is quite problematic because the Venetian case, Karaman is strongly referring to a single city and its influence rather than that of the entire republic. So the Ottomans are referred to as occupiers who used to live in the analyzed area and their occupation influenced the not so widely spread of Islamic art. So how is Venice defined as a central in relation to other areas? There were multiple examples, so I hear this in just several of them. Uh, in the very first introduction, he refers to Dalmatia's uh, political leader Venice. Then, when he's describing in detail the provincial environment, uh, he says that Venice is rich in assumptions. There is a dominant Venetian impact. There is the impression of Venice, even the pocket forms of Venice when he's describing the eastern towns. Uh, also, he says Venice is a center, and there is a Venetian power in the eastern Adriatic. While describing borderline environment, he says that there is a dominant influence of close Venetians. Also, there is the shiny art of the political master. As you see, he says when describing the building's typical facade, a Venetian character that forms. And I also quote, he says, impoverished Dalmatia in the Baroque period received insensitive and follows the art of Venice. And also, when referring to Zada, he explicitly says that Venetian influence was felt earlier than in other towns. While describing peripheral environment, he says there is a trade and cultural adriatic metropolis of Venice, and again, that it is a political master of Dalmatian Lystia. Uh, also, when describing palaces, he says that it, it determines urban development, general appearance, and arrangement of palaces in the towns. So, as I said, the next approach, uh, while analyzing this book, uh, was uh, important was to analyze the representation of fortification architecture. So how many times was it mentioned actually in thesis? It is almost not uh, represented at all. There are exactly five cases in the book when it was mentioned, and not always as an example of a representative construction practice in one of three categorized environments. So while he was describing the borderline environment, there were four cases of Venetian influence, especially in East Vietnam, because he's saying the city forests are mentioned as one of the Venetian forms from the Gothic to the Baroque period. That's all. Next, he said in Dalmatia, the difference between the coast and the inner lands is visible because uh, where is the Venetian government? The commune erected buildings of public importance, walls and gates of the city, public lodges, fountains and well, warehouses, etc. While the inner lands of Istria, their monuments, uh, they're, uh, they're much sparser at the time, and characteristics, however, are the remains of strong woods, which needed to defend their feudal lords. Then again, he's mentioning while well, describing the inner lands of the Eastern Peninsula that these burgs are in prominent strategic places. In the heart of the peninsula is the town of Pazin, again, Mittal Burg is its name, and a series of burgs in the Russia Valley. Uh, on the other hand, in the Venetian part of the peninsula, he says that as an opposite to that type of burgs, there are palaces and Renaissance castles, such as the one in Svetlinchena, who I'm showing you here, that has, uh, that has been erected. Uh, he, in the last part, when he finishes the description of the borderline environment, he uh, mentions the Italian travel of masters, such as those who constructed the fortress of Sisa in the 16th century. Uh, this is interesting, I'll come back to that later, but uh, in his whole book, he's focusing mainly on Dalmatia, but he's giving the example of the fortress of Sisa, which is in Italy. 
Uh, finally, while describing the peripheral environment, he says that Venetians are primarily concerned with saving cities from the Ottomans, building fortifications, city walls, and towers, building arsenals in which the galleys are kept and built, etc. He also mentions there were so-called fragments of reflection of Venetian art, and he's mentioning Lombardi, Sansovino, San Michele, and Palladio, which is interesting because he said so-called fragments of reflection, but we have in Zada and Shibeli new water fortifications that were constructed under the military, military engineers, both Michele, San Michele, and John Giorgio San Michele. So these were not reflections, these were negative fortifications. So the question is why fortification architecture is not represented? Does it at all have artistic value according to Carman? And why is only Sisek introduced in his book, especially emphasizes the animation art, where were the first examples of application of modern fortification principles? Or it is not mentioned because he cannot analyze it, it with his approach, because perhaps the construction sites of fortifications were actually their own centers of practice. So from the beginning of this research, uh, initially of the fortification architecture, there are several research problems that are continuous and difficult to solve. For example, the non-standardized terminology, distinction of theory and practice, especially the architectural treatises, vast diverse archival material, etc. Uh, in addition, both Croatian and foreign, especially Italian scholarship on the matter, are highly influenced with the dualistic center periphery approach. In this case, uh, I define periphery as a category, of course, opposite to the center, which is highly influenced by it, but also serves as an area of open experimental practice. Uh, Croatian scholars observed single fortifications and then compared them, uh, trying to emphasize their specificities, whereas Italian scholars mainly observed Serenissimo fortifications as a whole, but the area is always referred to as a peripheral one in the Venetian region. How does one then research architectural type that are mostly constructed at the borders of the state? So in this particular typology, the location factor is crucial for its understanding. Venice as a city cannot be taken as a construction site center, but it can be the center of theoretical principles, ideas, power, economy, etc. It was a place where decisions were made on how its borders will be protected, and the projects have been erected on the construction sites in the so-called periphery, if I could quote other scholars where changes were often made due to the constant war danger, better understanding of the location, etc., how was also the case in Zada. However, the style category that is examined through the entire book of Isis of Taran is quite problematic in its architectural typology, when often the new stylistic forms could have only been executed on the gates or windows of other diverse types of fortifications. So new theoretical architectural forms of construction were spread throughout the treatises of fortification architecture, and furthermore, the experimental location has not always been on the construction site, but we may also say inside the book in the treatises. So in this case, the term center is quite problematic, but it is not maybe the worst one. Uh, however, it is not observed as a geographic term that represents a single location with exclusively artistic influence, but rather, let's say, an abstract category which could be manifested in many forms, commercial, political, artistic, constructive. So these centers of power need to be connected in order to allow the circulation of different knowledges. So this creates a wide network that then allows knowledge to be spread in different directions. Eastern coast of Adriatic contains many centers that coordinate in this defensive network. And in order to protect the dominion, Serenissima had to be protected in each part of this territory. A case of Venice was a specific one, and still is, because as the capital of the Republic, it was strongly defined by its surroundings. Thus, if the best defensive example cannot serve as a construction site center for other construction sites of the completely different surroundings, as you see in Chile, in Zadar, etc. Its nearest were placed on the so-called city borders, the islands of San Andrea and Lido. It is one of the examples how the cities, as well as the states, are on micro level, also defined by a center of power and its borders. There are such examples, especially Dalmatia, where they also represent a strategy of political presence. Uh, I define them here as Castelli, for other reasons, uh, in opposition to the city walls of Zadar, Trogir, and Split. And they had a role uh, of the citadel. It is an enclosed fortification for a bigger crew, also defined as a type of fortress which is connected to the city walls on the best strategical position in the city. However, they primarily served in the 15th century when they were constructed as defenses against the citizens 
in the case of rebellions. So each of these castello was surrounded by a ditch and close to the harbor, thus providing better natural defense and refuge to the soldiers. So it is a repetitive case of a single building in several cities with similar appearances, thus forming sort of a typology. Furthermore, that sort of urban changes and fortified realizations created a defense dualism again inside the cities, those closer to the center of power and those further away. So the question is, does that mean that those further from the center of power are less fortified and therefore less protected, which of course is not true. And to conclude, the contribution that Yuval Karaman has left in Croatian art history is indisputable. His practical approach and systematization in the analysis of artworks and monuments has contributed to the better understanding of power relations within different Croatian historical states over the centuries. However, his approach may not be applicable to each architectural typology, particularly the fortification one. In this paper, I try to reanalyze his most influential text to indicate his crucial problematic points and to propose a slightly different approach in the case of fortification research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Carol, for this wonderful um, sea travel across, <laughs> across the sea. Uh, and throughout the thinking of Karma uh, as applied to the fortification architecture. Our next speaker is uh, Associate Professor at the University of Zadar, Lanis Boric, uh, who is also <laughs> a team member of Adria. And he will be speaking about the applicability of and the transform transformative nature of Karma's notions of territorial provincial in the nation Chita Chain. Thank you. Good morning. Yubu Karman's meticulous observance of pre modern creation, architectural, and artistic heritage was based on his rich conservation practice and a direct insight into the plethora of types and forms, as well as his academic origins within the Viennese formal school. Some of its meanest pupils' methodological shortcomings and sideways, he managed to soundly contextualize and to form one of the founding stones for our understanding of particularities of architectural and visual language in the Eastern Adriatic within their organic developmental context, enabling their emancipation from both self colonizing and nationalistic manipulative discourses. Even though his concepts are loosely based on Regal's revolutionary deconstruction of classical visual patterns, Karaman admittedly retained the traditional geographical pattern of center periphery dichotomy. However, he did not see the emanation of styles from artistic centers exclusively as the process of political or cultural domination on one side or the factual appropriation of forms on the other, but as a function of what Shlygovsky previously defined as forces of movement that accompany political dominance, merchandise pathways, and directions of social and cultural flow in general. Simultaneously, there are the so-called forces of resistance performed by indigenous traditions and tendencies and determined by their social and economic conditions. Realizing that the preceding art historians had overemphasized one or the other power, he defined three paradigmatic concepts that have determined the position of local artistic production, the border area, the provincialized, and peripheral, of which the latter two will be the focus of this paper. According to Karman, the artistic utterance of the provincial milieu is dependent on influences from major centers transformed by the impact of complex social and economic circumstances. Yet it is not seen in exclusively deprecatory terms, since Karaman dialectically recognized a certain amount of freedom that enabled the inclusion of local, regional elements through symbiosis of ethnic and regional influences with beacon impulses that emanated from centers of cultural and political power. These interactions eventually led him to identify the most creative category of regional arts, that of the peripheral media. This category included the most appreciable <coughs> phenomena and examples that accomplished a wide synthesis of heterogeneous influences acquired and reinvented in the creative freedom of the peripheral environment. Such liberty of development, unrestricted by artistic authorities and the canons of style, empowered the emergence of a particular visual culture that would have been suppressed in cultural centers. Peripheral art thus reaches the full developmental potential of regional artistic utterance, preserving the link with the stylistic and environmental context of European art, but simultaneously allowing the unrestricted developmental possibilities of the regional Yanis Lodzi. 
Thus, the peripheral MPN is not merely a passive recipient of ideas and style. Even though Karaman's categorization never resulted with a systematic theoretical elaboration, it was well received by a number of Croatian art historians who appreciated the, his empirical experience and dialectic contextualization, which formed the firm groundwork of the discipline. One of the reasons for its applicability was a competent elimination of ideological, political, and nationalist intelligence that had dominated the troubled 20th century of the Adriatic Rim. It is interesting to notice that there has never been a speculation of possible influences, whether conscious or non-conscious, of the particularities of Yugoslavian cultural climate of the 1950s and the 1960s, the contemporary political concept of non-aligned countries, and related rights of cultural feminism. Evaluating Karaman's thought, Radovan Ivanovic acknowledged its synthetic nature that played a cohesive role, preventing the atomization of the discipline. Nevertheless, the categories have also been subjected to criticism, particularly because of their single linear positivist, positivist nature, nature and the strong adherence to the simplified duality of center and periphery. Milan Prelo remarked that such an approach lacks the insight into the complex metabolism of regional arts, its functions and the relations between heterogeneous layers. Bojida Gago objected that Karaman's notions were too closely linked with the national and geographical paradigm because even the emancipated peripheral art is seen in relation to that of the center. The peripheral phenomenon should be observed outside of the standard system of thesis statistics, such as central peripheral. Regional art should be, Gargo says, articulated and interpreted according to its own values and not be set by the center. However, Gargo's questioning of the essence of regional or, or national art seems to extract Karaman's particularities of the peripheral, he says, I quote. It is different from all that is outside and different. It is always its own, always something else, the other structure. Uh, unquote. Still, Gagne did not dismiss the importance of the artistic communication with the centers because, I quote, despite the basic impossibility of transferring the more advanced exogenous style, a series of subsequent attempts to implant the shoots of another species has had a favorable impact on endogenous tendencies encouraging their appearance and formation. However, they should be judged following their own context and values and not the preconstructions and cliches of the art histories of cultural centers. By setting an alter alternative system of values, regional art history would be able to reinterpret and critically value local production. Since their reception, Karaman's concepts have been modified, updated, and methodologically reinvented but they are still deeply integrated into contemporary contextual methodologies to the extent that one should raise the question whether the traditional geographical paradigm might act as an obstruction to the wider acceptance of alternative methodologies. The contemporary creation art history of the medieval and early modern period has turned its focus towards the cultural contextualization and determination of manifold relations between the artwork, the artist, and the society, but many of its understandings are still imbued with the concept of the peripheral in the most emancipated sense of their relation to the mainstream artistic production of Europe throughout the centuries. Admittedly, Karaman's peripheral art, which was conceived ex exclusively upon its relation to the artistic centers, might appear as self-colonizing and even provoke observations of the awakened postmodern observer. But his elevation of the idiosyncrasies of the periphery, their own internal, internal energies and developmental logic, has kept the regional art historical narrative free from any trace of either uh, eclectically colonial or zealously indigenous narratives. Still, it needs to be challenged, be questioned, and repositioned within the broader context of ideas emerging from the global humanist networking. In this way, the revised, enriched, and contextualized Karaman's concepts can be beneficial methodological tools in our observance of the manifold transformative nature of regional architectural and visual language. One of the possible lines of such reinterpretation can be applied to the peculiar peculiarities of the architectural phenomena of the Mission Cinquecento, where structures, proportions, and decorative programs often follow, but mostly diverge from the corresponding classical models and sources which undoubtedly originated in Italian cultural centers. Such a comparative survey considers the categorization of processes through the lens of the interrelated Cinquecento linguistic practices and literary models, 
as well as their trajectories towards humanist centers of the Eastern Adriatic. This phenomenon does not only include the verbatim translations of the original text, but more often consists of the edited and innovative referrals, liberally formed adaptations, as well as the fragment citations of paraphrases, sometimes even on reductions or additions of original elements into the original literary concepts and structures. In both textual and architectural examples, the common point of departure is that is constructed around the notion of the classical expression that in architectural history refers not only to the comprehensive use of the Argentina <coughs> vocabulary, but also to the thoughtfully composed units that emerge out of the initial concept. It is dependent both on the idea and the purpose of the building, as on the author's imaginative powers developed within the comprehensive architectural tradition. It is also built around the Cicocento concepts of licencia, author's imaginative liberties and its conditioning by the predefined set of rules of the lack of it, which we may relate to Karman's liberty of the peripheral creativity versus provincial misinterpretation of the original. When Servio speaks of the orders in his fourth book, he also associates contemporary thriving of both the architecture and the linguistic utterance through a comparison of the original creation of an architectural concept with the process of literary creation the choice of words with particular emphasis on what he called judicia, the author's judgment which discerns beautiful and appropriate from the ugly, misunderstood, affected, vague, and confusing. As soon as one opens the comparison between the trajectories of classical architectural language and that of the literary influences, the corpus of research and the variety of its phenomena becomes, becomes intriguingly rich, but far out of the scope of this paper. Therefore, I will single out some examples that were most influential among the nation and the Roman humanist circles, such as the pastoral models, particularly those in which Arcadian settings were recognized in local regional topoil, thus strongly relating the classical key in its indigenous donation or Iberian concept. Perhaps the most interesting case is that of the earliest creation novel of the mountains, Planina, by Peter Zoranich, a cousin of Andreas de Wong, by the way, modeled after Sonazaro's pastoral novel Arcadia. However, set in the factual area of Zara hinterland, which is seen as the Arcadian world with manifold references to contemporary social and political, occasionally even apocalyptic setting, with shepherds whose echoes comment the reality in an allegorical manner. Another creation she presented to author, Marian Drzic, who is orange, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Marco Marovic, who is orange, first reference in the mountains as Shepherd Maru, uh, was also influenced with such Arcadian settings. Um, uh, in, in any case, these all can be seen as the localized transfers of the established literary models, not only translated, but seamlessly adapted into the regional key, so that they represent an entirely innovative literary values that were yet to be locally reproduced. On the other hand, there, there are examples of more or less exact translations of the Quattro Tasso Saminita and translated into, into creation by Domingo Zlatanich in 1581. Subsequently, Zlatanich reworked and adapted the play and published it under creation title Lubir in 1597, renaming all shepherds in creation. Accordingly, they can roughly be categorized according to the degree of the interpretation or distancing from the respective source text as the exact translations, transfers of the models, adaptations, paraphrases, or mere references, which often avoided the integral use of a classical concept in a whole. Paul Davis and David Hansel have already used literary and philological analogies as methodological lenses in the research of the early modern architectural phenomena. Still, it needs to take these terms within the scope of various understanding of Cipocento licencia, perhaps upgrading Vazari's viewpoints that welcomes inventive compositions that feed on the classical sources, as he called them, compondo da sé, and greatly outshine them but rejects the composition, composition Akazo, which he regards Zari as monstrous, quite expectedly, since the basic purpose of his book was to establish canonical values and the education of a cultivated and early type. Vazari's awareness is the basic proof that even the cultural centers permitted such aberrations, at least to a degree, and at least of the educated elites disapproval. In the major Cipocento architecture, these transformations are caused by a number of factors, many of which belong to Karaman's elements of either provincial or peripheral milieu. 
For example, some of the non-standard proportions of some Italian sport of the Referma in Zabar are determined by the width of the Roman de Comandos. While it's overly, while it's overly dense and plastically emphasized decoration that does not appear in other San Michele's gates in that measure, along with the fastidiously chiseled forms, may be explained by the collaboration of Guillermo Luigi, Corcho and Lapizida, whose work reflects local patrocinto traditions. On the other hand, Rubicic's own utterance was to be classicized by his Zabarnishi in collaborations with Veronese architects, which is to be seen in his subsequent Dubrovnik works, such as the Palace of Fran 